Marcy, it's probably about to press speed. It's probably in the bonus game where I'm going crash at the time. Hello fellow RC explorers, today we're going to build a mini tricopter. Okay, so let's get started. First thing we're going to do is build the arms. You need four 18mm screws and two motor mount plates. You also need some blue Loctite. I highly recommend using Loctite throughout the build whenever you're screwing anything metal into metal. Stack the two motor mount plates on top of each other and make sure that the holes line up. Then take a screw, add some Loctite and shove it through. Then we're going to position that on the motor and screw it in just a couple of turns. Repeat this with the other three screws. Separate the two plates and make sure that the hole in the arm is pointing in the right direction. Then shove that arm through the four screws until it lines up with the end of the motor mount. Using a 2mm Allen wrench, tighten down the screws. But don't tighten it down all the way. Move in a cross pattern and tighten them down a little bit at a time. That way you will get an equal pressure on all four corners and the motor will end up straight. Again, make sure that the hole is in this direction and the motor leads are pointing inwards. Next we're going to mount the prop adapter. But before we do that, get rid of this nut. It's made by the devil and it's going to make your copter crash. Just throw it out. Just get gone. Okay. All motors that come from RC Explorer comes with a black lock nut to replace this nut. Use that instead. The prop adapter is attached with three small screws. Use blue lock tight again and make sure that you don't over tighten the first two screws. We're going to use those to guide the prop adapter so it's on there nice and center. Then we can tighten all the screws down. Next is the speed controllers. I highly recommend getting some of the 6mm wire mesh. I got mine at Hobby King but multiple different suppliers have them. Cut a piece that's roughly 75mm long. A good tip to prevent the edges from fraying is to melt them on something hot. I used this old soldering iron but you can use a lighter or whatever. Now the edges are nice and strong. I highly recommend inspecting the ESCs for solder balls or anything else left behind by the manufacturing process. This one looks good so now we can put on the wire mesh. Get the wire mesh up until it touches the PCB. This way it's going to be nicely covered by the heat shrink later. Now we're going to cut the motor wires. Be sure to leave some slack in there because it makes it easier to solder and it also makes it less likely to break in a crash. Strip the wires a couple of millimeters and then twist the ends to make them not fray. Then pre-tin them. I recommend using lead based solder as it's much easier to solder and it also melts at a lower temperature which is less stressful for the PCB. If you don't have access to a one wire BL Heli programmer I highly recommend testing the motor direction after this step. If the motor spins the wrong direction, simply desolder two of the wires and switch them. The EECs come with this piece of heat shrink. Just slide it on and then shrink it using a hot air gun. Now you can use one of the included zip ties to fasten the ESC to the boom. Just be sure that you don't over tighten this zip tie, because it doesn't need to be that tight. It just needs to hold the EEC in place. Now we're going to shove the wires through the boom. Just insert them and push them through. If it's too little space in there, you might need to take away the servo connector. Just unplug the pins on the servo connector and then route the wires through. Push in the wire mesh properly. This way it will stay in place and protect your wires in a crash. And it looks nice too. Now repeat these steps and make the other boom just like this, except mount the ESC on this side instead of the other side. So they need to be the opposite side so they're protected in the crash. Time for the back arm. You need these pieces. And we're going to start with the tilt mechanism. Put the top and bottom pieces together and then take the 40 millimeter screw and just shove it through. It might be pretty tight so you might need to use some force and or a 2 millimeter allen wrench. Now feel how tight the tilt mechanism is to move. It should be very easy. If it's too tight, take it apart and use some sandpaper to sand the edges down. You want the tilt to move with hardly any effort. There shouldn't be any binding or anything, it should go really smoothly. Due to manufacturing tolerances, I'd rather go with a tighter fit than a too loose fit so you get too much slop in the tail. It's easier to remove material than it is to add it. 
Mounting the servo is really easy. Just take the servo spacer, shove it on the arm, then take the servo, shove that on the spacer, and you're done. Then take the tilt and just slide it on the servo splines. Then take a 2mm allen wrench and tighten down the screw. Tighten it all the way, but then you have to untighten it a couple of turns, otherwise it's just going to be seized up like crazy like this. Two or three turns usually does the trick. Then it's going to feel nice and smooth again. Use the included zip ties to tighten it down against the boom. Make sure that the knot of the zip ties go in an alternative pattern, so right, left, right, left, right, left. Then take two zip ties and make a loop. Make two of those loops and then use them to fasten the servo. Make sure that all the zip ties are nice and snug using a pair of pliers. Then cut off the zip ties. You might think that we forgot to center the servo, but you can actually center the servo later through CleanFlight, which is much easier. All you have to do is just unscrew the screw and then just slide the servo back. Then just tighten up the screw again. Just remember to unscrew it two or three turns, so the tilt mechanism can move freely. Tighten them out the motor. Do not use the countersunk screws that the motors come with, but rather use these flathead ones that come in the tilt mechanism pack. Don't forget to use the blue Loctite and also mount the motor so that the motor leads point backwards and outwards to the side like this. This is so we get the least amount of stress on the cable and the smoothest moving tilt as possible. Now we're going to solder the motor leads to the speed controller. Cut the leads roughly where the heat shrink from the bullets end. Then strip the wires, twist the ends and then pre-tin. Always pre-tin. The power and servo leads on this speed controller is going to be too long, so we need to cut them. Cut the red one at 140 millimeters and cut the black one at 85 millimeter ish. Then desolder the servo wire and cut that to roughly 150, 155 millimeters long, and then solder it back on. Just keep track of which one was the negative and which one was the signal. Cut another piece of 75 millimeter long, 6 millimeter wire mesh. Put that over the cables. Just like the other speed controller, just make sure that the wire mesh is all the way up to the PCB. Then you can put on the heat shrink and shrink that. Then take a small piece of 8mm heat shrink and put that over the end. It's there to protect the end of the wire mesh and the cables. Then strip, twist, and pre-tin the wire ends. Now pre-tin the power distribution board. We need to add a power connector, and to do that we need some short pieces of wire. I use 14 gauge, and I cut them to these lengths. You need a power connector of your choice. I'm going to use an XT60. Remember to always plug in the opposing connector. This way, if you overheat the connector while soldering, it's not going to deform and not fit after you're done. Soldering the power distribution board and the power connectors can require a very powerful soldering iron. Make sure that you have something that's up for the job, otherwise you're going to end up with melting pieces of plastic instead of actually soldering stuff. This connector turned out pretty good. So let's solder it to the power distribution board and make sure that you get the polarity right. Minus should be the black and positive should be the red. The reason why I made one cable shorter than the other is because I want the connector to poke out on one side of the boom. Now we're going to solder the back EC to the power distribution board. Start with the negative wire. Just solder it straight up and down and then the red wire should route around like this. This way it's not in the way of the boom coming in later. While we're at it, we can solder the front booms as well. Just make sure that the speed controller is facing the backwards direction so it's protected in a crash. Always re-tin cables that you get from anywhere. You don't know which kind of solder they used and you do not want a cold solder joint. Just add some of your own solder so you know you get a good solder joint. The speed controller from the RC Explorer shop already come with the correct length wire. All you have to do is just solder it on. Make sure that you solder the red wire to the positive and then black wire to the negative. Otherwise stuff is going to blow up. The power distribution board comes equipped with extra pads on it. 
I'm gonna have the servo connector and plug that into my receiver which has a telemetry port. That way I get the voltage down to my transmitter. Before we solder anything else to the power distribution board, we're gonna fix the FPV gear. I'm gonna use an Immersion RC 25 milliwatt 5.8 gigahertz transmitter and a Roncam Sky 2 board camera. I'm gonna power both of these straight from the flight battery. But first I need to get the video signal from the camera to the FPV transmitter. A simple servo connector will suffice. I didn't have a crimping tool at home, so I used the normal pair of pliers and then just slightly add a tiny tiny bit of solder to it. Just be really careful that you don't get anything into the connector itself. Okay, that harness is now down and we can solder it to the board. I'm gonna solder the power connector for the video transmitter and the camera to the same pads. Excuse my hands being in the way by the way. There we go. So plus and minus goes to this little connector here which powers the camera and then the video signal goes to this little servo connector that plugs into the video transmitter and so does this power connector as well. Before we start routing these servo connectors it's a really good idea to mark them in some way so you know which one is what. It's going to save you a lot of headaches down the road. I usually just scratch mine with a screwdriver. Next we're going to solder the pin header to the NACE32 board. Just shove it in there and you want it mounted at an angle like this. So we're just going to add some solder to the outermost pins. So while pushing the pin header back with your hand, reheat those two pads. That's going to make the pin header stay at that angle. Oh look at that, it looks good. This is so the servo wires get a little bit more clearance. Then just solder the rest of the pins. Look at that fanciness. Now we're going to connect the 5 volt output from the built in BEC in the power distribution board. And to do that we're just going to take two small pieces of wire and make a little bridge. Again, excuse my hands for being in the way, but it was kind of hard to work like this. But you'll get the point. Be very careful to solder plus to plus and minus to minus, otherwise you're going to fry your NACE32 board. That seemed to work pretty good. Now we're going to route all the servo cables through the hole in the NACE32 board. Don't forget the cable from the servo. I highly recommend routing this on the left side of the boom. This way you get plenty of space because the power lines are on the right side of the board. Now we can finally start screwing the frame together. You will need the frame holders, the front spacers, some 18mm screws and some lock nuts. The front holder goes on like this. Just put it on top of the frame and put two screws through. And then put the front spacer underneath that. Now this part is going to be somewhat of a hassle. You have to lift everything at the same time and not make it fall out by just holding things in the correct order and then put the lock nuts on. Just tighten them down with your fingers, that's enough for now. Now we're going to do the back. We're going to use four 18mm screws again and then mount the plates so that the holes on the flared part poke out the sides. Make sure that you don't squeeze any wires when poking the screws through. Again, tighten down the four lock nuts just using your fingers. We're going to tighten down all the nuts at the same time later. Now find the only two 20mm screws that are in the kit. They're going to be used to fasten down the carbon fiber arms. And you need to shove them through from the bottom. Take care so you don't squeeze any wire inside of the tube. On this side I had some problems with the wire being in the way. So I used the 2mm Allen wrench and slightly jiggled the cable back and forth until it moved out of the way. That worked really well. Now put on the lock nuts. Now it's very important that everything can move smoothly without binding and that no cables are squished anywhere. So double check that and triple check that before tightening stuff down. I use this 5.5mm turnbuckle tool to tighten down the 3mm lock nuts. Start by tightening down the front arms. If you use the correct screws, the 20mm screws, there will be this part sticking up here. That's how we want it. That's very important because we're going to screw something into that later. Now before tightening down the back arm it's very important that you check that it's in the right position. It shouldn't be so far forward that it's touching the pin header but it shouldn't be so far backward that it's not in between the two screws. Take care not to over tighten these nuts. You can very easily go crazy if you have powerful tools and it will bend and crack stuff. You can tighten down the front screws while you're at it. Now we can add the last two 18mm screws. These screws are there to lock the front arms in place using friction. If you move the arm all the way forward and then tighten down the screw pretty tightly, it's probably going to be correct. What you're looking for is that you can push the arm all the way forward and it still touches the screw, but it should be tight enough so that it requires some force to push it all the way forward. 
You can also tighten down the screw that's holding the arm to increase the overall friction of the arm. That way you can absorb more energy when the copter crashes. Now we can plug in all the servo cables. If you look at the board from the back and count from the left, the order is skip one, left, right, back, skip one, servo. As you can see I messed this up, but I'm going to fix that later on. Now we can attach the ESC on the back with some zip ties. As you can see I'm not putting a zip tie over the ESC itself, rather I'm just strapping both sides of the cables. This will prevent the solder joints from fatiguing due to the movement of the tilt. Make sure that the tilt can move freely and that the cables don't stretch and pull. Now we're going to attach the 40mm standoffs to the frame. Simply screw these down using your fingers and if you want to you can add some blue Loctite. The back ones are simply attached using two 6mm screws. You can use an allen wrench to hold the screw in place if you want to, but I find that the friction is usually strong enough. Now I'm going to install the receiver, but first I'm going to fix the error I made while installing the servo cables. I'm going to use a PPM receiver, so I only need one servo cable between the NACE board and the receiver. I also plugged in the voltage sense line that we soldered on earlier. Okay, now for the fun step, let's build a frame! This is the Mobius plate. It can be mounted at two different angles depending on if you want to mount a Mobius camera inside of the frame or not. You can change the position of this plate later, but it's a little bit of a hassle. Oh, and the fit on this plate is a little bit tight, so you might need to push it against the table. This plate also has two slots in it for the included GoPro strap that you can use to fasten your Mobius or GoPro Session 4 inside of the frame. Now we can slide the top piece of the frame into the slots on the side plates. It's a pretty tight fit, so you might need to wiggle it back and forth a bit. Make sure that the gap in between those two pieces is roughly this big. Now we're going to add a 40mm standoff in between the two plates. And you're going to use two 6mm screws to attach it. The purpose of this standoff is to stiffen up the frame and also to stop your battery so every time you mount it, it's going to be on the perfect CG every time. To adjust this, all you have to do is unscrew these two screws and then just move it. I'm going to move mine all the way forward so it's not in the way and then I'm going to adjust it once I get the battery in. Now we can attach the cage to the main frame. Slightly separate the two side plates by pushing it out with your fingers and then slide it over the front frame holder. Line up the slots with the tabs and then give it a slight push. Do that on the other side too. Now we can attach the top plate to the 40mm standoffs that we put on the frame earlier. Again use the 6mm screws and just screw them in place. This design makes the cage ridiculously strong and it can take a really hard beating before breaking. Now flip the mini tricopter over. We're going to attach this 40mm standoffs to the bottom. Make sure that you push it down all the way so it sits nice and snug against the frame. You might have noticed that there's a couple of extra holes here. It's because you can attach the cage to the full-size tricopter as well. This is great for protecting your electronics or getting more real estate to mount stuff to. Or even having the little board camera mount in the front. Speaking of board cameras, let's make the mount for this one now. You need this plate, two 40mm standoffs, four zip ties, and two rubber bands. So let's get started. Put the zip ties through the hole and close them off, but don't pull them too tightly yet. I usually mount my zip ties so I get the knots in towards the board, that way it looks a little bit nicer. Then simply slide the 40mm standoffs into the loops and then close the zip ties. If you're scared that the metal standoffs are going to short your camera at some point, you can add some heat shrink before doing this step. But it's very unlikely. But yeah, you never know, just in case. The recommended board cameras on the Mini Tricopter product page have this little notch in them, which keeps the camera from rotating. So all you have to do is just push it in and then use a rubber band to fasten it down. If you use a different board camera, you might need to attach the camera slightly differently. The rubber band's function is to save the camera in a crash, even the lens. So you can actually push on the lens and the whole camera moves back. This is going to help protect the lens and the board camera itself. And in a really terrible crash, the zip ties will pop off. Now let's install the camera in the tricopter cage. Simply slide it in and use four 6mm screws to attach it. I don't recommend using Loctite on these screws because you might want to change the camera angle as you progress in your flying. The angle can be set between 0 and 40 degrees, which is a pretty extreme, but if you know how to pull your sticks, then 40 degrees is fun. For the first flight, I highly recommend setting it at 0 degrees or maybe 15 degrees max, so you get used to it before you get go crazy. Now we're going to attach the video transmitter. 
I got a little bit lazy, so I'm just gonna put it right here on the side. That's gonna leave plenty of room on the top so I can mount my GoPro, extra things up there. Where you end up mounting this stuff all depends on which setup you're running. If I were to run a Mobius, I would put the video transmitter on the top plate. But in this case, I'm going to run a GoPro, which is going to sit on the top plate itself, so I don't want the video transmitter to be in the way. Also, mounting it like this is going to give me easy access to the dip switch. I can change channels very easy, which is good when you race or when you fly with friends. Now we're just going to attach the receiver antenna, and then we're almost done. You can mount the receiver antenna inside of a tube if you want to, but I usually race pretty fast, so I want the antennas to be at a 45 degree angle. That way I get the best reception and best transmission from the video transmitter. That's it! You're done! All you have to do now is mount the props and you will be ready to fly. I highly recommend mounting the props this way. But before mounting the props, jump over and watch the NACE32 setup video. It's really important. While following the NACE32 setup video, copy the settings from the product page for the mini tricopter instead. It's very important, otherwise your copter is not going to fly well. Also read all the instructions here very carefully, because there might be some stuff that's different. Thank you for watching. Good luck with your build. Oh.